Well, good morning. I hope you guys are having a great spring break, whether you're watching online or you're in the auditorium. Hope you have a great week relaxing. Wish that I was there with you guys, but I am excited because two weeks from today is Easter Sunday. And so we've got some amazing things planned. We're going to have a great celebration in our services. We're going to have some family pictures and a few other things in store. So if you could do us one thing to help us best prepare is go to our website at bpc.life and register for which service you plan on attending. Okay, it doesn't cost anything. We just want to make sure we know how many people are coming to our 915 or our 1045 service. So again, you can register on our website at bpc.life. Now this morning, we're going to be diving back into our series called Holy Spirit. And really, each week has kind of been building off of each other. And to get you caught up, we've really worked on establishing this definition of who the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is God's personal presence. Right? The Holy Spirit is not some impersonal force like in Star Wars. It's not some kind of mystic field in the universe that we tap into. The Holy Spirit is actually God's personal presence with us. That wherever we go, God is not far away. Whatever we're struggling with, whatever we're going through, God is right there in the midst of it all. In fact, even this morning, God's presence is here with us. Now, the Holy Spirit is God's personal presence, but he also brings life. And we talked about how even in the very first pages of the Bible, the Holy Spirit is hovering over chaos and disorder. And out of all of that, he brings creation. And even in our own lives, there's places that feel disordered. There's areas that feel chaotic. There's areas that may even feel dead. And the Holy Spirit wants to bring life and order and new creation. He wants to create us into someone new. And then last week, we hit on the last part of that definition. It says that he empowers us to become like Jesus. And really last week, my favorite thought was the fact that Jesus is the perfect picture of a person empowered by the Spirit. Like if we want to know what a life looks like fully empowered by the Holy Spirit, simply look to Jesus. See, that same power is available to us. But then that leaves a question, at least for me. I wonder, well, wait a second. If I follow Jesus and I have the Holy Spirit, God's personal presence working in my life, then why don't I look like Jesus yet? Why is it that sometimes my thoughts go to places they shouldn't? How come sometimes I use words that, that I don't need to use or that I lose my anger? I don't know if you've ever had this happen to you. Sometimes you'll be in an argument and somebody will say something, and all of a sudden in my mind I have this wrestling like, oh, I could say this one thing, that would really like drive the knife home. I would really hurt them. And then I start to think, but wait a second, that's not who I want to be. But part of me wants to do that. Part of me doesn't. So why do we have this struggle on whether or not we're becoming more like Jesus? Why isn't just like with the, the flip of a switch, all of a sudden we look like him? And see, that's a great question. In fact, it's one of the questions that the early Christian leader Paul is addressing in Galatians chapter 5. In fact, in a few minutes, we're going to read some verses that are very famous. They're called the fruit of the Spirit. Maybe some of you grew up in a church context where you learned a little song where you could memorize all the fruit of the Spirit. But before we jump into those verses, I want to kind of back up and give us a little bit of context to what's going on in this letter. See, Galatians is a letter written by the early Christian leader, Paul, to some of the first Christians who are in several different churches in Galatia. And there's a fascinating controversy that's building in these churches because a lot of the very first Christians, in fact, most of them came out of a Jewish background. Now, in the Jewish faith, there were lots of rules and regulations and laws that they would follow. And it wasn't necessarily that they just didn't have anything better to do or that they had a very legalistic faith, but they saw this law as the way they had relationship with God. In fact, here's maybe the best way that I can explain this. Back in ancient cultures, if nation A conquered nation B, 
nation A would enter into a relationship with the, the nation they just defeated, and this was oftentimes called a treaty or a covenant. And so what the conquering nation would do is lay out the terms and conditions for what a relationship would look like. Like, hey, you know what? You guys need to pay us taxes. Your king can remain in power, but you're going to help us with our military. And here's all the things you're going to do. Now, in exchange, here's the blessings that you're going to get from us. We're going to make sure your infrastructure is taken care of. We're going to provide protection. We'll funnel some tax money back to you. And so there's a reciprocal relationship, but the conquering nation lays out all the terms. And what makes this different than a normal contract is that in a covenant, it's meant to stand for the entire life of both parties. So the only way you can exit a covenant is if one of the parties dies. And what does any of this have to do with the Jewish faith? Well, in the Old Testament, we read how God entered into a covenant relationship with his people. And so he gives them what we look at as laws, but these are simply ways that they can remain in relationship with God. And they keep their end of the bargain, and in return, God's going to bless them. He's going to use Israel to bless the nation and to bring heaven to earth. But what makes this covenant unique is that God says, not only am I going to uphold my end of the bargain, I'm going to uphold Israel's end of the bargain as well. So even when Israel's unfaithful, God will be faithful on their behalf, which sounds great, except that we know that those laws could never actually change people's hearts. In fact, it gets to a point where the, the nation of Israel turns their back on God. They don't want anything to do with him. And so he removes his protection and they're conquered by their enemies. And so the question is, if God's going to do something new, he has to change this first covenant, but how can that happen? Because the only way a covenant can end is if one of the parties dies. But didn't God say he would keep both ends of the bargain? So the only way to do away with the old covenant is God has to find a way to die. That's exactly what he does through Jesus. God comes to earth and Jesus keeps both ends of the covenant. And when he dies on the cross, he does away with the old way of doing things and relating to God. And when he rises again, there's a new way of relating to God. And that's by having our hearts transformed by the Holy Spirit and staying in relationship with him that way. Hopefully this is making sense because what's happening in these early Christian churches is that the Jewish Christians look at the non-Jewish Christians and they're a little confused because they don't follow all the same laws that the Jewish Christians grew up following. Like they're not circumcised. They don't eat kosher. They don't follow any of those. And so in their mind, they think, well, you guys need to know how to behave. So if you're really going to follow Jesus, you need to become Jewish as well. And so they're telling these, these non-Jewish Christians, you need to get circumcised, you need to eat kosher food, you need to follow the Sabbath and all of these other things. Well, Paul is frustrated because he says, guys, you're missing the point. When Jesus died, he did away with the old way. The, the writer of Hebrews says that old way is now obsolete. Because if Jesus died just for you to keep doing the same things, then he died in vain. And so at the beginning of Galatians chapter 5, Paul actually says it's for freedom that you were set free. Jesus died to set you free from that old way, and now you can live in a new way. But the question is, how can people know how to follow Jesus if they don't have all of these laws they're supposed to keep? In other words, how can people become like Jesus if they don't have a list of all the do's and don'ts. And that's what we're going to pick up in Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 16. Paul says this. He's talking to the non-Jewish Christians now. He says, I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit, and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other, so that you don't do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, there's a lot going on in these verses, but essentially what Paul is saying is, guys, if you would just walk by the Spirit, you won't give in to the desires of the flesh. You don't need a list of do's and don'ts. What you need is the Holy Spirit to guide you. And if the Holy Spirit guides you, of course you won't give in to these fleshly desires. 
In fact, that word flesh in some translations, that they, they translate that as sinful desires, which I actually think is a, a better way to interpret that. Because I think sometimes we get confused on what the Bible means when it talks about flesh. See, when God first created humans, what did he say about our bodies? In Genesis chapter 1 and 2, he said they were good. Not only that, that they were very good. And our bodies have natural desires like food and drink and sex. Those are all normal God-given desires. But sin and death have perverted those desires. So we don't just want food. We want to overindulge. We just don't want drink. We want to go all out. We don't just want sex. We want to have sex on our terms and on our way. And so what Paul is saying is, yes, we have these desires that are all out of whack, but if you live by the Spirit, it's going to show you how you ought to live. And yes, we know that the Spirit's going to want some things and your flesh is going to want something else. But at the end of the day, if you follow the Spirit, you don't need the law. Now, he's going to go on and he's about to list a bunch of the acts of the flesh that Paul actually says are obvious. But like we know inherently there are things that we probably shouldn't do. So he's going to flesh out what does it look like when all of these good desires are kind of twisted against God's design. That's where we pick up in verse 19. Paul says, now the works of the flesh are obvious. And he starts listing, there's 15 different uh, desires he lists. And he groups them together in a very fascinating way. Notice the first few here. He says, sexual immorality, moral impurity, and promiscuity. And all of those have to do with how our sexual desire has been twisted. And it's fascinating to me that this is where Paul starts. That even how we handle our own sexual desires says a lot at whether the spirit is at work or the flesh is at work. And bear in mind, when Paul's talking about sexual immorality and moral impurity, he's coming from a Jewish background. So, So he knows the scriptures talk about the proper place for sex is in a committed relationship between a man and a woman who are married. And I know sometimes if we can just take a moment to recognize that that seems backwards to our world. In fact, to say that that is kind of the the vision of sexual ethic that the Bible teaches, the world tells us it's backwards, it's primitive, it's repressive, sometimes it's even oppressive, and that you need to be liberated to feed all of your sexual desires. And in a lot of ways, it makes us feel like maybe we're, maybe we've got it wrong. Maybe we've got things backwards. Maybe we have too low a view of sex. But the reality is, is that God understands that sex is more than just a physical act. It's the mingling of souls together. And so to place sex within a committed marriage relationship between a husband and a wife is actually the most honoring thing that we can do because we understand the power that sex has. See, if sex was just a physical act, then we could tell people who are victims of sexual assault or sexual abuse to simply get over it. But see, we know inherently that that's more than just a physical act. There has to do with intimacy and our entire being is wrapped up in that. And so we want to have honor and respect for that. And what Paul is saying here is even in the way that we treat sex says a lot about how our desires have been twisted. In fact, even from a biological perspective, when when a husband and wife have sex together, their bodies are flooded with oxytocin. This is sometimes called the love or the bonding chemical. When a mother uh, gives birth to her child, both of their bodies are flooded with the same chemical, and they actually have a strong bond. From a scientific perspective, there's nothing quite like the bond between a mother and her child. And in the same way, sex bonds us together. And furthermore, what studies have shown is that when you have multiple partners, the bond gets weaker and weaker and weaker and so scripture is not trying to, to limit or, or inhibit us because God doesn't want us to enjoy sex. No, he wants us to enjoy it to the fullest, but our sinful desires twist it. And here he starts off by showing how our desires are even twisted against what's best for our bodies. But then he continues into the next segment of desires. And he says, there are also idolatry and sorcery 
And I'm going to stop here for a moment because idolatry refers to worshiping things other than God. And sorcery was a practice where you would try to manipulate spirits or beings in order to get the outcome that you wanted. And it's tempting to read this and to say, well, I don't have a little, you know, figurine in my house. I don't have idols and I'm not practicing witchcraft, so I'm not guilty of sorcery. But I actually think there are things in our life that we put above our relationship with God. And furthermore, I think there are times in our life where we may not call it sorcery, but we do feel like if we do the right things, then God owes us something. There's a tendency towards manipulation there. I think this is why sometimes when life doesn't turn out the way we want, we get frustrated and our gut instinct is to say, well, God, wait a second. I went to church. I was faithful in giving. I led life groups. I had my kids there every week and now they've wandered off from you. God, you owe me more than this. So even though we might not think of it as sorcery, I think there are ways in which our sinful desires, we want to manipulate God into getting what we want. So not only are our desires twisted against our bodies, they're twisted against our relationship with God. And then he goes into the biggest section. I just want you to listen to all of these desires he lists out here. He says, hatreds, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy. I mean, you read all of those, and I don't know about you, but I've noticed many of those in my own life. All of these represent how our desires are twisted, even against other people. Do we find ourselves envious or jealous of others? That idea of selfish ambition. It's like we want something even at the expense of somebody else. Do we find it hard to celebrate when someone else gets engaged because that's what you've been longing for 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 years? Is it hard to celebrate when someone else gives birth to a child because that's what you long for? Is it hard to celebrate when they get the promotion because you feel like you deserve it? I mean, talk about divisions, strife, all of this stuff, by the way, is the way that our world works. We're told that that's normal. In fact, turn on cable news. It's entirely driven on fear that's intended to cause divisions and divisiveness because what the world says is we're never more united than when we have a common enemy. And so we have to create enemies out of people who disagree with us. So we see how our desires are twisted against our relationship with our bodies, our relationship with God, and now our relationship with other people. There's two more that Paul mentions here. He says, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. He goes on to say, I'm warning you about these things, as I warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. There's so much we could say, but when he's talking about drunkenness and carousing, uh, this is actually refers to how people would practice in pagan temples. This was part of worship to other gods. Again, just twisting even how we relate to creation. But he has that phrase there where he says, people who act like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And I know that's caused so much stress and anxiety because sometimes we think, okay, I've probably been guilty of many of these, sometimes multiple on the same day. Does that mean that I am not part of the kingdom of God? And see, I think that misses the point of what Paul is getting at. See, Paul's trying to remind them that the things you do, do something to you. And when you act in these ways, it solidifies your character and your identity. So if all of these things become a marker of who you are, then to be in the kingdom of God would feel like hell to you. Like if we're given over to sexual immorality and envy and divisiveness and drunkenness, you wouldn't want to be in the kingdom of God because you wouldn't want to live under the rulership of Jesus. And so if you're stressed and you're wondering, does this mean I'm not in the kingdom of God? Paul's not talking about you. The point he's trying to make is if we give in to the desires of our flesh over months and years, then all of a sudden we become people who have nothing to do with the kingdom of God. So the question is, okay, if that's not who I want to be, then what kind of person should I be? Jesus, what should I look like if I want to look more like you? Paul answers that 
in the very next verse, verse 22, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. And I want to stop here for a moment because when we use the word love, we can mean a lot of different things. You know, I love football. I love an Oreo blizzard from Dairy Queen. I love my wife. All of those statements are true, but they all mean something completely different. See, when Paul's talking about love here, he's talking about a self-sacrificial love, a love that says that something else is more important than me. In particular, what Paul's saying is that the Holy Spirit, when he brings fruit in our lives, it looks like love that God and other people are more important than us. And I believe in the next eight that he lists, it's all just fleshing this out. In fact, Paul doesn't say the fruits of the Spirit, like there's nine different fruits. I think there's one fruit, and this is what it looks like. It looks like love. It looks like joy. It looks like peace. And in fact, joy and peace, these aren't emotions. These aren't feelings. These are attitudes that we get to choose. Like we get to choose whether we're joyful and peaceful or whether we're not. And yet far too often, I think we allow our circumstances to determine whether or not we're people of joy or peace. In fact, I, I had this thought this week. If you look at the prayers that Paul puts at the beginning and end of each of his letters in the New Testament, what I have found is Paul doesn't pray that people's circumstances would change, but he does pray that people would change. And I think so much of my life, I've been praying for circumstances to change when I ought to pray that the Holy Spirit would bring about the fruit of joy and peace. It reminds me of when I was in high school, my parents took me and my sister on a cruise for 11 days. And I was an idiot because I was in high school and I thought 11 days is a long time to be away from your friends. And now that I'm an adult, I would kill in order to go away for 11 days on a cruise. But what made this cruise particularly interesting is it was a fairly uh, rough cruise because the ship was following along behind a tropical storm. Now, there's big waves, and you could feel it inside the ship, but I don't know if you've ever seen a cruise ship before. These things are massive. And so there were definitely people who needed to take some medicine for being seasick, but I don't think any of us were ever worried that the ship was going under. And really, it was because the ship was so big. See, we, we didn't deny the fact that there was a storm outside, but we had peace because of the vessel that we were in. And if we want peace, we're not denying that there aren't storms that are going to happen in life. But when we're hidden in Christ, we don't have to be fearful and worried about every situation that comes our way. But we can choose joy and peace in every circumstance. He goes on from there and says, kindness and goodness. I mean, I think kindness and goodness are so underrated. This is how we treat other people. And like, we're people who are kind and good, even if other people are not kind and good to us. Like, even if other people are rude, if they have stabbed us in the back, the very character of who we are is we treat people as friends, even if they treat us like enemies. In fact, I skipped over patience there. I think some of the translations have forbearance. And patience, this one is one that I personally get challenged with all the time because this talks about our patience, not necessarily with God, but our patience with other people. We have to be patient that other people are growing in their relationship with Jesus at a different rate than we are. Like we can't expect other people to be exactly where we are in our relationship with God at the, all at the same time. And so we have to learn to forgive other people for not being Jesus. And this really comes when we give up our need for control in other people's life. And we just say, hey, listen, I'm going to trust and have patience that God is going to work in them. I know even sometimes in my parenting, I want to control specific behaviors, which I guess as a parent, I could do to some extent, but the reality is I'm learning to be patient and to trust God to continue to work and to grow my kids into who they should be. He continues on and he says, faithfulness. 
is part of the fruit of the Spirit. And I think this is underrated because I think a lot of times faithfulness is, is not a word that we look at as like a strong character word because we kind of bounce from job to job or relationship to relationship. But I think that, that faithfulness shows that we are committed. And even if someone hurts us, we're, we're not going to turn our backs on them. That even if we're wounded in a friendship, that we don't write them off. Listen, I know we're in a culture that we want to write off people who are toxic and not have anything to do with them. And certainly, if there's abusive relationships, we definitely need to, to distance ourselves from those. But I think far too often, we allow wounds to develop into bitterness, and we cut people off. We leave friends. We leave churches. And the reality is God has called us to be faithful. Listen, if you're a bridge point for any amount of time, I can promise you this. Somebody's going to let you down. I'm going to let you down because we're all people. We're all imperfect. It'd be so easy just to walk away and to go somewhere else. But man, God has called us to be faithful. And I think faithfulness over the years brings about so much fruit in our lives. He kind of concludes things by saying gentleness, which by the way, I think is so amazing because our culture can tend to look down on gentleness. Like that's a character defect. Like we don't want a leader who's described as gentle. We want a leader who's a take charge, aggressive, like a type personality. But the reality is we ought to be gentle people who don't just always tell it like it is or put somebody in their place, but we're gentle in our interactions. And then the last one is self-control. That always kind of stood out to me because I'm like, wait a second. This is the fruit of the Spirit. So the Spirit's doing work in our lives, but part of that work is that I would have self-control. Now, you would think it would be Spirit control in our life, that the Spirit would just put me in a trance and all of a sudden I wouldn't have these temptations or frustrations anymore. But the reality is that the Spirit wants to do work so that we have self-control. So is the Spirit at work or do we have self-control? The answer is yes. The Holy Spirit wants you to grow to a point where you can overcome temptations, thoughts, feelings, emotions, that you can continue to develop into the person that God wants you to be. He says, against these things, there is no law. Now, it's fascinating that Paul uses the metaphor here of fruit. Because we think sometimes, well, wait a second, I follow Jesus you know, now I've prayed and I've asked the Spirit to fill me. Shouldn't the fruit be instant? I don't know if you ever planted a garden. Nothing about gardening is instant. Nothing about growing fruit is instant. In fact, there's some fruit plants that it may be one or two years before you even get any crops out of them. And in the meantime, you know what gardening takes? It's a lot of work. When my wife and I bought our first house, there was a little walkway out in front of our house. And in between kind of our front porch and this walkway, there was this grassy area with a bunch of big bushes. And we decided this would be a great place for a garden. So we went to take out these bushes. Turned out they were rosemary bushes. So by the time we were able to get them out, I smelled like a Thanksgiving turkey. So we just like pull these things out. But then we have to till up all the land and pull out all the grass we had to bring in soil. We had to kind of water everything, prep it, make sure it's got the right acidity level. And then we got to plant our plants. And then we got to put the mulch down. And then we were done, except that we weren't. Because even just prepping the land and planting the plants, that's just the beginning. Because then you get to do this wonderful thing called weeding, where you pull out all the other things that want to grow in the garden. And then you have to make sure you're watering the plants and you're caring for them. And then when they start to look really pretty, all of a sudden we found out not only did we have plants in our garden, but we had animals like rabbits who wanted to eat all of our plants and deer. And so now, you know, we have to like fend off against these wild beasts that are trying to destroy our garden. See, growing stuff is a lot of work, and it requires really two things. The first one is that you have to, at the very least, create the right conditions for growth. See, like when we had our garden and we had all these beautiful flowers and fruit and all this other stuff, at no point do you look at it and say, I made this grow. 
No, all we did is we prepped the soil, we planted some things, we pulled weeds, we watered it. But at the end of the day, like if there's not enough sun, it doesn't matter the work we do. It's not going to grow. Like we don't have control whether or not these plants produce flowers or fruit. And in the same way, we can't control whether there's fruit in our lives. That's fruit that comes from the work of the Spirit. But what we can do is create the right conditions for this kind of fruit to grow. That's why for the last few months here at Bridgepoint, we've been emphasizing the importance that if you call Bridgepoint your home church, we want you to have a rule of life. It's not rules for life. This is those habits we talked about, those spiritual practices, taking two of them and implementing them into your daily life. And see that that phrase rule of life comes from the Latin word regula. It's where you would stick a ruler or a stick in the ground so that it gives a place and direction for a vine to grow so the vine can produce fruit. See, what we do when we have those practices, we're giving a place for the spirit to begin to work. Because we, when we spend time in silence and solitude, and we're just resting with Jesus in the morning, then all of a sudden we realize it's easier to make the choice for joy and peace despite the circumstances around us because we've already hidden ourselves in Jesus. And when we put into practice the art of confession, it becomes a lot easier to have patience with other people because we realize, hey, I can forgive them because I know I need forgiveness as well. And so as we spend time in these practices, we're doing the work of creating the right environment for fruit to grow. But the other thing, besides simply creating the right environment, we have to do things like we have to pull out weeds. We have to fend off the animals. There's some things that we need to get rid of, that we need to fight against. Paul actually gets at this at the end of this section here. Verse 24 says, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. He says, hey, we, we've crucified our flesh. In fact, just a couple chapters earlier in Galatians chapter 2, Paul says, it is with Christ I have been crucified. Like when we follow Jesus, it's not just Jesus who is crucified. We were crucified with him all our sinful desires and passions. Jesus didn't just come to save us from the consequence of sin. He came to save us from sin itself. And I think part of this is we remind ourselves every day of that gospel truth that we have been crucified with Jesus. And then we do the work to be diligent, to pull those fleshly desires out of our life. But you struggle with lust and pornography, then maybe swap out the smartphone for a flip phone, which I know seems crazy. But see, in the moments of temptation, we want to preach ourselves the gospel. But before we even get there, let's do the work of putting ourselves in position where we can pull those things out. Maybe you find yourself given to division and strife. Maybe turn off the TV, get off social media. I know that seems radical in today's society, but sometimes we have to be diligent to crucify the flesh and get rid of those obstacles so that the fruit can grow. I love how he ends. He says, if we live by the Spirit, then we walk by the Spirit. In other words, if we want to have a life defined by the fruit of the Spirit, we have to walk by the Spirit every single day. Every step that we take is a step driven by the Spirit. Every thought we think ought to be a thought that's prompted by the Spirit. But the only way we can do that is to provide the right environment and then be diligent to pull anything out of our lives that doesn't help us produce that fruit. And if we will do that, I believe that the Holy Spirit will begin to make these things characteristic in our lives as well. So as we end our time together this morning, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to end with a time of silence and solitude. Because I know for many of us, this is the only time every week during these few response minutes here that we can just sit and be still with Jesus. And so in just a moment, I'm going to pray. Our communion tables will be open as you feel led.
But I would encourage you to spend this time sitting with Jesus. Maybe he'll speak to you about some of the things you need to pull out of your life. Or maybe he'll just remind you of those practices that we need to put in place to create the right environment. I don't know what he has to say to you, but in this moment, instead of asking him for something, let's be silent, be still, and listen to what he would have to say. Let's pray. Jesus, we're so thankful. We're thankful that you don't leave us to our fleshly desires, but that you've given us your spirit and that it's at work even right now. And so I pray that as we spend a few moments in silence, that you would speak to us. You would encourage us. You would challenge us with how to create an environment and also pull out things that don't belong. And that your spirit would be at work to create fruit in our lives. Because Jesus, we just want to look more like you. It's in your name I pray. Amen.